is there anything you'd want me to refer to you as I, in the intro? Yeah, I mean, just Fever Monument is fine. Just my username. Okay. Well, two, three, Fever Monument, Fever Monument. Let's, let's go! You have been sober for 10 years now. Is, is that right? Yeah, yeah. In May, I celebrated 10 years of continuous sobriety, which is crazy to me. It's been a long road, but, but I'm glad to be here. Congrats, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a very far cry from where I came from. Uh, I mean, I, I can give you like a kind of rundown of how how it sort of developed with me, if that if that works. I think that would be great. I mean, anything you can tell us about those those kind of dark times and and how deep in you got in your experiences, I think that would be really really neat. Yeah, I mean, um, I had a bad childhood, um, like. My dad was super abusive to me and my mom. We had to like flee him when I was three. Um, my mom was addicted to pills. She did like some time in jail when I was super young, which really kind of like messed me up as like a little kid. And then through high school, I didn't drink in high school. Smoked a lot of pot, hung out downtown, but like drinking wasn't really my thing. But I moved to San Francisco when I was 18 and living up there, you know, most of my friends were kind of in their early 20s. And so they would, you know, get me into the bars that they could get me into and going to parties and stuff. I, I started drinking and I think it was, it was pretty clear from the beginning that I was definitely like a bad drunk. If nothing else, I would get a little too wild. I would I would kind of black out sometimes. As time went by, that became more and more of a, a thing in my life. Uh, I started to realize that I I liked it, and once I started, I didn't want to stop until I was fully fully drunk. And it, it remained a really social thing and not a problem until maybe a couple years after that when it started becoming more of a of an everyday thing and i ended up losing my job uh and that was because i was showing up to work like drunk or if not drunk then very very hungover consistently and i ended up going on like a bender and not showing up to work for I think at least like four days damn and I was super fucked up and i remember calling them and like you know what i quit and they were like you haven't been here for four days we fired <laughs> you like two days ago i didn't maintain another job for years after that because i just started going full into to drinking all the time after that i was kind of staying with people not really having my own place like i lived in one of my friend's closets for a while Every time I drank, I would get blackout drunk and I would have like these crazy, it was either I was having like crazy emotional breakdowns or I was getting super aggressive mm. and I would like go try to pick fights with people that I definitely never had any business trying to pick fights with. <laughs> and, you know, I would, I would end up like getting my ass beat at bars and people would have to like carry me home. I wasn't trying to get jobs, sometimes go to interviews, but I would be going to interviews drunk. You know, there's a lot of partying still going on in a lot of these places. So sometimes I didn't even have to worry about getting my own booze. I would just, you know, go to parties and steal other people's. Two or three years of that, constantly drinking. And I could, I could hide in that, you know, it was everybody was fucked up. So if I was super fucked up, nobody really realized that it was a huge, huge problem. I was burning bridges. I was disgusting. You know, I had maybe like three <laughs> t-shirts, sleeping on couches and gross, disgusting, sweaty all the time. Do you think you smelled like alcohol? Oh yeah, oh yeah. There, There's no, there's no way that I did. Yeah. A combination of like sweat, alcohol and like refry cigarettes <laughs> I, I would do 
shit that Cobra does. Like I would go and collect cause I couldn't afford cigarettes. So I would go and collect like cigarette butts and then roll them into, into full cigarettes. I smelled horrible. I looked horrible. My face would be all swollen and red all the time, mm-hmm. but just like emaciated otherwise. That lasted for a couple years. I ended up back in my hometown, and that's probably the point where like things got really, really bad. I had moved in with a friend of mine, and I had actually managed to get a job, uh, which is probably the worst job that I've ever had. Like you know, the like fancy car washes where they like towel dry it, yeah. and like they'll tail your dashboard. And one of my friends, old friends, was like a manager at it, so he got me a job doing vacuums which is definitely a job I could do in that state. But while I was doing it, I was doing like the most pathetic shit. Every car that I vacuumed, I was like scrounging through it for loose change. Oh yeah. And I would like steal change out of cars so that I could go to the liquor store next door on my break and get like a tall can of malt liquor and like just down it on my break and then work the rest of my shift drunk. It was all day, every day, all night, all I was doing was drinking. Like the worst possible alcohol, like bum wine. Like, I don't know if you've ever heard of like Thunderbird or Night Train. <laughs> no. It's it's like fortified, <laughs> fortified wine. It's this disgusting, like thick, oh. uh, high alcohol content, stuff that comes in like plastic bottles. Yeah meant to be really economical. Yeah. Really yeah. cheap, but very powerful. Yeah. You just run around, blackout drunk, causing all sorts of trouble. And he worked at like a nursing home as like a janitor. And he would go around and like steal pills. We'd meet up and we'd get like a couple 40s or whatever. And we would like spend the first part of our afternoon, like going through all these pills that he got, looking them up on the internet to try to figure out which ones we could take. It kind of makes me think of the wet bandits from uh, the home alone series of, uh, of, of being oddly petty, picking up the, the change and finding pills and stuff like that. You got the really sticky fingers. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, and, and we, we did all, sorts of stuff i mean we stole alcohol constantly we would we would like steal other stuff that we could trade in we could go to a different store and return it for credit so that we could buy alcohol with that too we had all sorts of schemes when things started getting really bad was when i started having like really really serious withdrawal symptoms i would wake up in the morning having what they call DTs, delirium tremors or something like that. I would wake up completely disoriented, unaware of like where I was, when it was. I would wake up shaking, not being able to breathe. And I I started eventually going into basically like seizures, like where it it was more than just shaking. Like I, I would speeds up and couldn't like move at all that was one of the things that started to happen where i was just like i I, this is gonna like kill me i'm i'm gonna die doing this but i continued on for a little while longer uh i eventually lost that horrible job that i had um and was like hiding that from my roommate or like trying to which only worked for about a month because I didn't have rent money. And eventually it was pretty much like getting kicked out of that apartment. There were points where I had to like sleep outside, under bridges, uh, in parks. The night that I decided to get sober was, it was Cinco de Mayo, and we spent all day drinking, and I ended up with a group of my friends who were all like super bad alcoholics. We were in a cemetery. We were drinking vanilla extract, Oh, which that was something that we started doing a little while back because you can buy it on EBT because yeah. it's considered a food item, yeah. but it, there's alcohol in it. Oh, yeah. And it, it's, not, it's not like the right kind of alcohol, and it's not like a regular drunk. It's basically like you're poisoned. Oh. It's a 
really what it is, but it would kind of give you the alcohol that you needed in your system uh, to maintain. And I just remember we were, we were sitting in the cemetery pouring vanilla extract into like bottles of Coke. Oh, it, it was bad. Uh, it was really, really bad. And I finally had in the program they call your moment of clarity where for some reason it clicked in my head and I, I looked around and I was just like, I, I did, I can't do this anymore. I, I can't, I don't want any part of this. I'm, I'm killing myself. These are the people that I'm hanging out with. I'm, I'm literally poisoning myself to get a buzz. Um, in a graveyard. And, yeah. In a, in a graveyard, <laughs> in my hometown with people who I've known since I was 15 who are walking corpses basically. Yeah. Um, and so I, I got up and I like stumbled home. It was probably like two or three in the morning. I reached out to one of my uncles via Facebook who he had gotten sober, I think like five years before that. Um, and I reached out to him and just sent him like this big, long, like super drunken message about like, I'm sick of this. I can't do this anymore. I need help. Like, I'm really, really begging you. Can you please just help me somehow? I got, um, I got placed into this Salvation Army, like rehab program, yeah. which was really gnarly. It was really like horrible. Like I think my third day there, two guys had managed to sneak in heroin and had overdosed and died in the bathroom. Good Lord. Yeah, it was, it was insane. Like, and there were like guys who were trying to get me to like take their piss tests for them and stuff. And it was such an uncomfortable situation. I only did that for about two weeks. I, I did about two weeks in there. It was like a three month program. And so when I left, uh, you know, I continued to work through AA um, and did that for a number of years, got a sponsor, did all my step work. It was hard. That program is, is not easy. It's a lot of dedication. It's a lot of hard work about really coming to a lot of understandings about who you are and what you've done and what you need to kind of atone for and what you need to change. I, I, I stopped going a couple of years ago. There, there are things about the program that I don't really agree with. There's some, some of their attitudes I, I find kind of off-putting. And I also just, I haven't had any big like burning desires to drink. And if I ever do, I will drop in at meetings. You know, it's, it's overall, it's a very positive thing. Do you think that uh, we've seen any changes in Josh's physical appearance with uh, all the drinking he's been doing? Well, I mean, Josh is, Josh is like a, Josh is like a insane shapeshifter. Yes, he is. Time. He absolutely is. His, because, you know, I, I, I was watching the Windy Saga recently. I mean, thinking about seeing his body back then and what he looks like now. Yeah. It, the, the change is so insane, but his drinking has gotten really bad in the last month and a half or so i think mm -hmm. you can see it right now in his videos just the the way that he looks like you can see already it's kind of taking its toll he looks just his <laughs> face looks a little bit like swollen all the time yeah every time i see him right now and i mean he's just always like disheveled been wearing that same cradle of filth shirt for the hat yeah the damn hat. hat, like he sits on it or something. Yeah, that hat didn't want that. <laughs> that hat was made and had so much promise. John <laughs> has just violated it and run it into the ground. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's any like big physical changes with him yet. I think if this continues, we're definitely going to see it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to see if he can keep the money coming in. If Clint will completely take control of his finances, 
And I, I think it's yeah. all about money. He's said it for a long time now, very far back. He would say, I would drink every day if I could afford it. And that was the big yeah. barriers. He, he just didn't have enough money. Right. And, and, and I think that that's because I, I remember that another thing that you wanted to talk about is, is Josh an alcoholic? Like a statement like that from the past, I would drink every day if I could afford it. Yeah. Alcoholism is in Josh. He has it within him. It's in there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was watching a video from a little while back. He made some comment where he's like, yeah, there's there's people who, who care about me who are telling me, like, you're drinking too much. And I just tell him, well, I learned from the best. And I'm I'm almost <laughs> positive that that's that that's a that's a jab at Clint. Yeah. Is there anything that we know about Clint ever being like a big drinker or an alcoholic or anything? The only thing I've known of is that Josh used to steal his alcohol when he lived in the basement. In my time of watching Josh, he's never specifically said that uh, Clint had issues with drinking. No. His biological mother, I know that she had like mental health issues. Was she an alcoholic? I don't know. I mean, information on her, unfortunately, yeah, continues to be very limited. A lot of people have said at least that Clint put his dick in crazy. <laughs> and it's it's a really harsh lesson to not do that. And it does make you wonder if uh, maybe he's not even jabbing at Clint, but he was talking about his mom when he said that. In either case, I think that it's definitely, it's it's something that he has. You know, you did the whole episode about addiction. Mm -hmm. And in, in that episode, when you guys talked about alcoholism, it was discussed that I think the, the general consensus was he's not necessarily an alcoholic, which which I agreed with at the time because I hadn't seen him exhibit any serious alcoholic behavior which is what we're seeing now is like the beginnings of very troubling alcoholic behavior. Yeah, right now I think that he's at the beginning stages of letting that alcoholism kind of consume him. I thought it was neat because I started reading about what they call the four stages of mm -hmm. alcoholism, pre, early, middle, and late. Right, and, right. And versus just it being kind of a binary yes or no alcoholic thing, you can at least subdivide it into <laughs> how deep you are. And I'm sure that a lot of people early on, they would say, no, he's not an alcoholic, but they probably would have said that he was either stage one or stage two. While right. these days, I would say he's a solid stage three. And we, we can kind of elaborate on those. I think it's a lot easier to at least categorize it versus just the yes or no alcoholic um classification whatever you want to say he's not in a in a place yet where he's completely like down and out it's getting to be clear now that he is starting to have like an actual need oh, for yeah. alcohol versus just a desire it's not like he wakes up and goes through a whole half a day and then decides like yeah you know i'm gonna have a beer it's just like get up start streaming got a beer in his hand yeah and that's that, that's a sign of a need and not like a, a want. A lot of people have noted that he'll start streaming, have a beer, and then just seems like he's wasted. And that has led people to conclude that he is drinking on the side before he even starts streaming. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't doubt that at <laughs> all. I mean, because you can tell. Before he cracks that beer, you can see that he's already at least a little bit buzzed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he's been streaming late recently, too, right? Like, uh, he'll all go hours. He yeah. is yeah. so erratic lately yeah. with his uh, streaming schedule. It can be butt ass early in the morning, and he's cracking open beers like 7 a.m., 8 a.m. And that was such a big flag for me, or just kind of a an event that showed where we're at when he was getting up really early to drink. With the, with the drinking off camera, there is that one video where he has his case of Bud Light Platinum. Yeah. And he does this whole big performative thing where he's like, you know, everybody's saying that I'm drinking too much, but you know what? I've had my limit. I know my limit. I'm going to put this case back in the fridge and I'm not going to touch it for a while. 
I guarantee you that as soon as he was done streaming, he ran to the fridge and kept on drinking oh, yeah. those beers. I, I'm surprised that he doesn't hide it more because it's insane to watch him just pound it like and like a whole six pack of Guinness. <laughs> also, Mr. Mountain Dew. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think about him getting banned from the CY bar? That is a very, very big indicator that you have uh, a serious drinking problem. I have been 86 barred and banned from a lot of bars in my time. Yeah. You have to think about how much you have to do to get like completely 86 from a bar. He got banned mm -hmm. for... Yeah, he was trying to get more alcohol, and he, he played it down as if they were overreacting. Yeah, no, of course. Of course. <laughs> everybody in the world is always against Josh. <laughs> Playing kick the um, autistic. I think they tried to just tell him, you've had enough, and he threw a fit from the sound of it. Didn't he accuse the, the poor bartender of like calling him an asshole or something? He talked about how he's a, a jerk or an asshole when he drinks, that he was trying to prove that he could walk in a straight line. So that made him eligible to get more drinks. Yeah. And I remember when he talked to the manager later on, because he was trying to oh. appeal his ban. I love that video. It was really good. And the manager kept such a cool head about it, uh, oh, yeah. interacting with him. Bro. But he was standing up for the uh, bartender. I think it was a lady. And he yeah. said, you know, I didn't appreciate what you said about her. We have to take it seriously. He handled that really, really well. Yeah. Um, a lot of all this drinking stuff with Josh, I think, is also very, very tied to the image of himself that he wants to project, which is goth, bad boy, rock star, right? Cowboy. So, sexy, too. Huge oh, yeah. cock. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Big muscles. Big dick. Yeah. Plays guitar. Good with animals. I gotta be a rock star and drink. I'm in your face and I tell it like it is. And so I think that he lets that get the best of him, especially in a situation like that. Even though I think if he wasn't super drunk, he would have been his normal self, which I think is super, super timid. Yes. In his attitude right now when he's drinking comes from is, is that desire to project that image out if i was managing that bar and i had this curmudgeon constantly coming in drinking too much screaming into his cell phone because he would do videos there too with with random yeah. people nearby not knowing what the yeah. hell is going on i i would probably want to just ban him because he's bad for business yeah i mean i i can't I can't imagine just trying to trying to have a good night out <laughs> at the T Y bar. You know, <laughs> like, hey, it's my Friday. I had a rough week at work. Yeah. Hey, you know, call one of your buds, man. Meet me down at the C Y bar, man. Uh, let's get a picture. You know, let's shoot the shit. <laughs> and so you go down there and you try to do that, <laughs> and John. I like to imagine he's sitting there. He tips his soiled, crumpled hat at you. His eyes are just going different directions. He's wasted. I say, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm, I'm just going to do a 180 and leave. Screaming into his phone. Yeah. He's not how he's going to go do karaoke and sing Hey There, Delilah, and he wet stinks. every walnut in a three-mile radius. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't want to go there. If, if I knew that guy was perpetually there or even the risk – of him being there uh, was was present. I'd want to try yeah. to go to another bar. It wasn't very nice either. CY was kind of a, a junky place, right? But uh, right, <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd ban him. I'd get him out of there. Uh, yeah. bad for business. I think there is there another one that he's ever talked about going to. His old stomping grounds. This was from a while ago. He used to go to a place called the Sandbar. Oh, okay. That's yeah. That's what I'm thinking. I of. love his videos from there. <laughs> 50 cent beer night. Oh. Yeah. You get such a good perspective into what it's like when he goes there because he'd be all by himself. Everyone around him 
is hooting and hollering and they're having a great time and he is just sitting quietly sipping beer and looking around kind of desperate for maybe a, a stray conversation or something i think at one point he did get up and dance or something uh, but it's a very lonely existence he had up in the uh, yeah. sandbar but uh the yeah, uh, sandbar got shut down it is gone no oh, rnp there's a complete removal now of the social aspect yeah. of drinking with him now i mean it's just by himself nobody comes over nobody even calls no the four stages i can very quickly cover yeah uh, just to help people understand, I will really make this yeah. quick. Stage one, pre-alcoholic. There's a, a little bit of evidence of problem drinking. Uh, it looks like casual drinking, so forth. You may drink when you're having a bad day. You're worried about something. You're anxious about something. That's pretty much negligible. Stage two, early alcoholic. You may black out sometimes. You may hide your drinking. You may lie about your drinking to your friends, family members, so forth. Stage three, middle alcoholic, and this is where I think Josh is at. Uh, the alcoholism is becoming apparent to your friends and family. You just, you can see it taking place. Uh, it talks about missing social obligations. You might miss work because you are drunk or hungover when you are not drinking, you become irritable, uh, you will argue with people, your friends, and so forth, and then finally, uh, your body changes. You get red, you bloat, uh, you may be less coordinated, you might lose weight, so forth. It talks about uh, finding help and support groups and stuff to keep you from getting into stage four, which is the late alcoholic, and uh, that's where you're drinking all day, everything takes a back seat to drinking, if you haven't lost your job already, it's going to happen. And then you start having organ failure, like cirrhosis, uh, dementia. Um, you might have the tremors, you know, the, the seizures and stuff like that. And I think if, if he were to keep it up, he'd probably be on the precipice of stage four. But I think Josh is an easy stage three. Yeah. There's mention of uh, missing your work and stuff, which with Josh... He doesn't really have a, any kind of hourly job, but I will say his business model for his wand making has uh, interestingly taken a turn. He now sells maybe one to two wands for, in this case, $300. This is the recent one he just put out. Yeah, I was I was thinking about that recently because he's constantly like, yeah, I'm going to finish these beers and then I'm going to do a little stick hunting and call that a Friday, you know. His work ethic has been changed, apparently, because he is so busy with other stuff right now. He always takes the path of least resistance. So if he's learned that he doesn't have to make a huge batch, he can just make two and sell them for $300. I think maybe even regardless of the drinking, he'd probably just continue doing that. I mean, he really needs to get out of the delusion that uh, making wands is an actual source of income for him yeah. even if he does sell these two wands and get whatever almost seven hundred dollars it's not a living and i think that's another factor that's making him just stay home and drink all day i wish so bad that he would get another regular job oh yeah that's when his content is the best because you know he's just talking about his interactions and navigating through a work day and there's always so much gold in that I'll be excited to see what happens with Clint. If Josh keeps finding a way to step on his toes, and it's not even really Josh, but Josh's uh, trolls, now finding ways to irritate Silverback Gorilla Clint, uh, he may start to get on his case some more. I thought it was really interesting that once, one, um, when Josh got evicted during the infamous phone call, a lot's up, Josh, he started mm -hmm. saying, Maybe you're drinking too much. Maybe you need counseling. And then they moved him. Josh wasn't so much a problem in Clint's life, and they seem to have just dropped that, the whole counseling thing. Clint is a rampant enabler. 
something needs to happen where Clint actually gets it through his head. Like, you can't yell at him once. No. And then that's it. Like, you need to follow through with what you're talking to him about. He'll yell at him, and then Josh will make a video being like, yeah, looks like I'm going to take a break. And then that's and then that's it. And then, you know, he doesn't stick to that, of course. But then it just said, you know, Clint just waits around for the next big catastrophe to happen so he can yell at him again. It's he there's no like follow through. Also, you look at how Josh reacts to that stuff. Yeah. Daddy dearest. Oh, yeah. Clint comes in to like plead with him. He's crying, trying to explain, like, I think that you need help. Something needs to change. Your anger is out of control. You know, I'm very worried about you. You don't have to be dead. If you're going to be a psychotic fucking raging lunatic who hates women and loves guns and loves violence, then you need to get out. You need to get out. You're apparently not that little guy. And this dipshit (laughs) who's recording takes it, (laughs) takes that audio and uses it as the intro for like some, his horrible, horrible music. Yeah. The the lyrical content to that song is just, it's, it's literally basically like, I have anger problems. So what? Yeah. I don't care. I'm I'm not your little boy anymore. Something like that. Really edgy stuff. None of it got through. A song off my one of my albums called Daddy Dearest. You hear my dad crying. You know what I see in you, Josh? I see a little boy. I see a little boy. Blah, 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 blah. You know, my dad came in one day, and you know, my dad's seeing the more psychotic side of me, the side I get from my biological mother, Laura. <clears throat> And, um, you know, my dad sees my psychotic side on YouTube and he gets a little, he was upset by it naturally. He starts crying his eyes out. And how the fuck I managed to record it on video, slamming the door when he's done. I'm like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this little crying speech he gave me. I'm going to put it in a song and call it Daddy Dearest. We're like... I'm not your little boy anymore. I've done a lot of growing up, and I've done a lot of hating. I have a lot of anger, but whatever. No. And, and, I mean, I can definitely understand. It has to be so frustrating to be Clint. But, like, he, like I was saying, he doesn't ever follow through with anything. And the eviction thing, obviously, I'm glad that Josh got a new house, but, like, Josh didn't have to do any sort of work to no. find that apartment. No. Like, you know that. Like, Josh was never in and. And Josh, when he was getting evicted, 100% knew that. He knew that he wasn't going to have to actually worry about anything. He would, you know, whine and complain. Just be like, man, it's yeah. going to be a crappy weekend. I'm going to have to clean my apartment and move stuff. And it's like, well, Josh, you, you kind of caused this whole thing. Just imagine what it's like for Clint, who doesn't want to have to do any of this stuff. I hope that Clint is being made aware of all of this that's going on right now and i hope that he sees it and actually like something clicks in his head and he's gonna realize like this is no longer a matter of me like yelling at josh or trying to get josh out of a bad situation this is like either i do something to get him help or change things with him get him to change himself yeah Uh, my son's gonna die oh yeah he's gonna die drunk there's a dichotomy of, of people who really get mad at Clint, and then there's others who say that he gets too much of a hard time for his parenting. There's two sides to it, for sure. It's not easy raising Josh. Josh is, is quote, a grown man. I don't completely side with that. I've seen a lot of talk from people saying that no one can technically tell him what to do. He's over 18, etc. 
but clearly he's not your ordinary grown adult. He needs a lot of supervision. He doesn't have the same mental faculties. It's kind of a moot point to say that he's over 18. Right. With Clint, I, I was very, very disappointed to see that after the farms incident where Clint got his live stream ruined, that only then did Josh appear and say, yeah, it's a, it's a personal choice. I'm going to take a break. Look at this beer I got. <laughs> That's a big hindrance for, for Josh ever trying to get help is the fact that <laughs> getting to a rock bottom for Josh mm. is going to be so, so difficult because he has numerous safety nets. Oh, yeah. That he knows are always there. I think that his rock bottom would probably be finally Clint following through with the ever dangling threat of a group home, which I don't think Clint is actually serious about. Yeah, I don't think so. Or or ever actually been serious about. And I don't want to see that. I don't want Josh to have to go to a group home. I think that Josh is more than capable of maintaining a life for himself he's he did it for years he didn't have great jobs he wasn't great at them but he had something and yeah he was bad with money but he had something resembling a normal life where he was to a certain degree independent on his own yeah and i think that he's capable of that and i don't want to see him put into a group home but i mean that might be the only thing that would click it over for him sort of immediately that like, okay, yeah, now I'm in a group home now. I I would hope that a good compromise would be, but I don't know if Clint would go through with it, making Josh some kind of casita, little, little house, little shed outside of the family house, but he would be in a super controlled environment of... yeah. Do you get this much internet per day? And you're going to do these things no matter what. Even just starting him off with like normal chores. Yeah. That would be a great option for Josh. I think that Josh would, would end up kind of thriving in that after a while once if he could commit to that. But yeah. it's also who knows if what Josh would do in that situation if he would get a wild hair up his ass and decide that he was just <laughs> leaving. He only has so many friends that he can abuse until he gets booted. He couldn't have a very long campaign of that, I don't think. I'm very worried that Clint won't. No. Won't actually. He's going to need to be inconvenienced a third time before he'll do anything. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So funny that after that happens, he'll go to Josh and say he needs to take a break. It's like, Clint, they're not going to let up, you dum-dum. If Josh were to actually leave the internet, the viewers would be even more hungry and probably irritated and just dump on Clint. I'll admit I was hoping for another Clint message after the incident of him yelling on his Facebook. We talked about covering the 12 steps and how awful it would be for Josh. Yeah. How hard he'd make it. I've got the list up here if you want to kind of power through that. Yeah. Maybe before we begin with that, do you know what would cause Josh's moment of clarity. Do you think there's any specific event that could cause the clarity? Well, I mean, he's he's made mention of other people calling him an alcoholic, mm. and his his reaction has been like, "So what? I don't I don't hurt anybody. I don't I don't make scenes. I don't bother anybody." I think that he knows. I don't think that he's had his big moment. I think that his big moment getting word that he was actually being sent away would be his ultimate like low point where he would finally realize like okay all of this drinking and crazy behavior this has consequences and this is it and it's all because of so i i would think that that would be his big moment he is big on consequences that's when suddenly he starts bargaining i remember uh during the clint call he immediately said, well, yeah, I can stop smoking inside. It yeah. was <laughs> it was far too late. <laughs> it for five years. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it came right out. He knew immediately what he needed to stop doing a long ass time ago. Right. <laughs> but yeah, consequences. Yeah, 12 steps. Uh, number one, honesty. 
honesty. So that's that's kind of like what we were just talking about is him. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's the admitting that yeah. you're powerless over alcohol. I mean, I Josh has a big problem with honesty is that Josh will be able to be honest, but he will skirt the blame to anybody and everybody around him or make it about him being persecuted. You know, I'm an alcoholic. But you know, it's not like I had a lot going for me anyway. What did you expect? I mean, that would be his immediate um, kind of take on it. There's two more that kind of go hand in hand. It it lists them as faith and surrender, which is believing in a higher power. So maybe in his case, uh, Lucifer, and understanding that he cannot better himself unless he surrenders to Lucifer and lets him take over his body. Right. And then that's, that, that's a big one. That's exactly what I was thinking was, I think that it would have to be explained to him properly. Yeah. Because like the way, the way that it's, I have the book open with me right here. It says power greater than yourself, but then through a lot of the other steps, it refers to God. Yeah. And that immediately is going to set Josh off. Big and it's problem. just a Fuck your sky god. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need your fucking sky god to make me sober. I'm a powerful wizard. I think that once he understood that it was just, it didn't have to be the Christian god, that it could be anything, I think that he would probably be like, oh, cool, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Lucifer. Yeah. yeah. Cobertin. Got to go back to uh, the old gods. Cabricius, Cabrero. Need Sean. all their power. Sean. <laughs> soul-searching, uh, got to identify their problems, get a clear picture of how their behavior affected themselves and others around them. Ooh, Clint. Yeah, are, yeah, you're on You're on step four. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, the searching and fearless moral inventory is how it's worded in the book. And oh. that, yeah, the, the exact wording in the book is made, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Um, so that, that stuff sucks. I can tell you that going through the program, it's, it's very, very difficult for like a normal person. That's going to be such a difficult thing with Josh. Cause I, I legitimately think that Josh very rarely believes that he has done something wrong. I'm thinking back to that video where he's saying, you know, after all these years, I, I finally forgave myself for cheating on Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> it still it sounds kind of self-serving, self doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, understand I mean, I understand that, like, forgiving, that, like, forgiving yourself, yourself is a thing, thing but it's, but just, it's like, just like, I don't think that he thought it was, if he did anything really wrong towards her. He, that one's going to be really tough, I think, for him. You have to compile a list. Like, you have to, your sponsor will make you, like, write out a list. Five... The way that it's worded in the book, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrong. Josh having to take his list, his inventory, and discuss it with his sponsor. Like I said, I think it would be a very short list. I, I think that his sponsor would have to really push him. Nothing will ever resemble a complete list but a list that's kind of satisfactory or like at least a little bit honest. I, I think that one, it's going to be a lot of the same. It's going to be a lot of the skirting responsibility. He's not going to take full responsibility for any of those wrongdoings that he does list. It'd be a big argument. I, I think he oh, would yeah. start to feel like he's getting bullied by someone if they keep pressuring him to come up with more things that he's done wrong. Right. That's like, that, that would be a big worry for me if you were to enter into the program because people stay on you and are doing their best to hold you accountable so that you can grow from that and learn how to, you know, maintain sobriety. I would worry that at that point he would, he would bail. It's such yeah. an opposite of his, his YouTube realm is just a big hug box where oh, yeah. he can be whatever he wants to be and... Aside from the trolls, he, he seems to get a lot of reinforcement regardless. I mean, people humor him. They kind of egg him on, and he loves that. But right. the, uh, the opposite would be these meetings where they are just rubbing his nose in it 
and having to not delude himself in the least. He would hate it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He would. He would be. I mean, in an actual meeting setting, he would immediately clamp up. I think it would be probably at least a year before he ever shared anything beyond uh, I'm Josh and I'm an alcoholic. Did you ever see the video where him and Robbie were talking and he's just kind of sitting and being lectured and you can tell he's just not comprehending or listening to anything? We've been able to see that Josh did not take any of that to heart and just continued doing exactly what he does now, which is blowing all of his money and making response videos. He's content with just wasting his time and sitting and staring and maybe nodding on occasion. Which is a shame because if he really had a problem with what Robbie was telling him, he should have argued with him. It's so lame to just sit there and just be like, uh-huh, yeah, well, yeah. It's literally the actions of like a child. Yes. Like a five-year-old child oh, yeah. who you're like, trying to explain like, hey, you can't do this because X, Y, and Z will happen if you do. And they're, yeah. Okay, just waiting to leave. I think we're uh, at the halfway point here with the steps. Six? Yeah. We were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. That's another thing where the if, if Josh were to read the book, that would trigger the, the fuck your sky God thing, I think. Well, Josh doesn't actually know anything about Satanism, right? No. Because I, I was thinking if, if his higher power was Lucifer, like the tenets of Satanism are, are, from what I know, it's there is no authority but yourself and do what you want. It's yeah. interesting because the, the website I have here, it's like the secular humanist version. It tries very hard to avoid uh, anything with religion or God. Oh, yeah. No, when, when you're at meetings, it's it's God and there's like, you know, you will... Because the, they read the steps at the beginning of a, each meeting, and it says God, and you'll see things up on the wall that say, like, let go and let God. And, you know, the vast majority of people that are in those rooms are comfortable with, you know, they're, they come from a Christian background. So, yeah, they're going to refer to God as, you know, the Christian God. But, yeah, it's, it's definitely the wording is very much God when you're in the program. That's such an and obstacle just, for Josh. Yeah. Yeah, for Josh, oh. definitely. I mean, it's it's gonna turn him off. He he's gonna he's gonna start accusing everybody in there of being like a Bible thumper, uh, you know, a religious Nazi. I could see him trying to maybe stir the pot a little bit and wear his like Jesus was a cunt cradle oh. of filth two meetings oh. and kind of like make it a point to show it off or something. Really passive. Which, Things yeah. where he, he yeah. may not uh, vocalize it, verbalize it, but he would wear the shirt. Yeah. You know what Josh will love about meetings, though? Everybody in an AA meeting fucking loves energy drinks. Really? Everybody. And and I, like, when I first got sober, I was super into it. Like, I, I, I would drink so much coffee and I would get so many energy drinks because it's like like a substitution but yes. i'll go to meetings and fuck me i can't even think about how bad it must be in casper wyoming because <laughs> i would go to meetings and you know people would have like three of like the tall monster cans That's lined up in front of them for a meeting so he'll feel he might feel comfortable with that if nothing else so the next step yeah i mean the next one is just a follow-up to that it says in here humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings so that's having your higher power absolve you sort of of your of your past. So much uh, of this is kind of clearing your your ego, uh, yeah. your, your identity, your conscious, all that stuff, kind of getting a clean slate and then saying, Jesus, take the wheel. The way that they, they phrase a lot of it is cleaning your side of the street because you can't control how other people feel but because the next steps that we're going to go through are where it gets like kind of heavy and that's where you have to take accountability okay so eight is going to be a very very challenging one for our boy made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all so josh having to again go back 
into his life and really look at how he's acted and who he's hurt and then even consider trying to make apologies for all of that. There's a lot of overlap, I feel like, yeah. where so much of it is, again, making this list, analyzing it, looking at yourself, all the things you've done wrong, compiling that. And it's one of the hardest things for Josh to do is look at himself and, and be humble about it. He is the sexy, goth, bad boy, old school, rock star villain. With autism. Can, doing with the autism. best he can every day, which is such a, a huge coping method for him is when he screws up or, or does something bad. He's got Asperger's. He does like to lean on that every now and again, which, which is just hard, again, for taking responsibility. And it's like there are plenty of people who have autism and who have like very severe mental health problems who can get sober and they go through AA. So much of Josh's like personality flaws have absolutely nothing to do with the fact that he has Asperger's. That's a very strong statement. I agree with you. I understand that Asperger's definitely does have an effect on him. And yeah, there's, sure. there's plenty of things that do, you know, there's plenty of things about him that are directly due to the fact that he has Asperger's. But I know, I know people with Asperger's. I know people with different forms of autism who aren't like horrible, weird, hateful men's rights incels. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I imagine it's that trope where someone comes home and they, they turn on the lights and someone has been waiting for them to talk to them like at a, at a table or something. And it's Clint. And he's just like, <laughs> Sit down, Josh. Listen, you being a little shit and having a bad attitude and everything that's been going wrong in your life, your Asperger's has nothing to do with it, boy. Clint really has played up that he is uh, handicapped. He, he has to overcome all these things. I, I think that's caused him to be not the best person he could be. That sort of thinking process is what would be his biggest hindrance with any of these steps. Yes, Josh has struggles. He's high functioning. Yes. But it's, he uses that as a crutch. It's one of the most frustrating things about Josh because I wish that he could just learn to accept his flaws that are within himself. So the next one, step nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible except when to do so would injure them or others. Josh would have to go and visit with all of the people that he decided he had done wrong. Crumpled hat in hand. I can see him now, like, you know, ringing the doorbell, taking the hat <laughs> off, putting it in front of his heart, and, ma'am, uh, going to, like, Stephanie's apartment. It would be just like when Clint punished him the a, a Carolyn uh, apology video, yeah. it would yeah, have that uh, same energy. He would start out probably a little bit sincere. I think that as he went on with his apology and had to get kind of a little bit more in depth into what he was apologizing for, I think he would get a little bit irritated. Yeah. And I think that if whoever he was apologizing to wasn't necessarily ready to take that apology, he has that tendency so much to just if you're not with him it's it's immediately that you're just against him and he he will get so frustrated to look at it from another angle when he was still rejected from the cy bar he didn't quite flip it on him and talk shit immediately he seemed to concede defeat yeah pretty well that's true it's and I it may just depend on his mood that day he could wig out and get super yeah. pissed one day, and then another, just be like, "Thanks for being patient with me." Mm, yeah, I, and I don't, I don't think that the anger would necessarily come out in the moment either. Yeah, I think we would probably get like videos. <laughs> I, I could see him, if not even outwardly, very being very, very frustrated with that. And and I mean, that's that's a reality of that step too. Is that you run into people who, when you're trying to make your amends, will literally be like fuck you. Yeah. Like, you're, you're a piece of shit. It happened to me with a couple people where, you know, I was legitimately trying to apologize and they're just like, I don't want to fucking talk to you. 
it's amazing because I think with Josh, he'd have a hard time understanding how any of this plays into him not drinking anymore. I think that him going to meetings, he would get because the meetings are people sharing their stories. You're hearing people talk about when they drank and what they were doing wrong. But I think doing the actual step work, I think, yeah, he would be fairly lost with what any of it has to do with alcohol. Being Josh's sponsor would be a, a challenge. If it were a really, really strong role model. I mean, are there any sponsors like that? Almost like a freaking drill sergeant type of personality who is really going to get on your case? Yeah, there's there's all different types. There, there's something to be said about that approach. I think that Josh would definitely need a gentler kind of handler. It shouldn't be someone that he can just abuse. Yeah. But yeah. They, they also can't be too rough on him. Because the whole, uh, if you're not going to play ball, then then just get out. I think he would jump on that. Yeah. Definitely. Somewhere in You'd between. Be like, oh, they, told me, they told me to go drink. I'm going to go drink. <laughs> I'm very literal. So the next one. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him. Praying for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. I don't think that Josh would, would understand what sort of any of that was getting at. It's kind of another one of those bubblegum steps. It's nothing that you really have to do, per se. It's more about keeping connected with yourself and your higher power. I think that Josh would poo-poo that and just consider it like a step that he didn't even have to think about. It'd have to be his own religion that he'd be tapping into again. I could see his copy of the big book. He'd draw his symbol on the front of it. Scratch out every instance of God in the book. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. and writing yeah, yeah. Cobra Tin or something, Lucifer. Yeah. I was really hoping that his higher power would be Sean. But Sean yeah. is so mean to him. <laughs> that, that, I mean, <laughs> God is cruel. I had a friend in the program years and years ago who she had a problem with God and the use of that. And she had her higher power be her, like, guinea pig. It's just literally admitting that you are not the end-all, be-all. The, you're not the center of the universe, which is sort of an attitude that they're trying to get out of you. Because when you are an alcoholic, you're the most selfish that you could possibly be. I'm, so I'm really warming up to the Sean idea then, because yeah, that's that's why I was thinking Sean would be perfect for him. He's definitely the one entity that just tells it like it is and really <laughs> gets on Josh's case. For all the things he's done wrong, Sean will just bust it out. He needs to Sean bring Sean. Sean. Yeah, he needs to bring Sean. When, then when it's time to say things. his piece and say everything he's done wrong, he'll have to do it through Sean. <laughs> <laughs> what was the joke? Okay. Uh, I worked at a funeral, funeral home. home. Yeah. Being assholes with no life and today is no exception. Every single time. Oh, yeah. Every meeting. Do you remember Rusty? <laughs> the snake? Yeah. Yeah. Just get the whole family in there. The last step, we're at the very end. If Josh could could make it all the way to this. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. That's talking about at meetings, reaching out to other people, like newcomers that you see just really being like very welcoming. It's it's one of the nicest things about going to meetings is everybody there is very, very welcoming. Now, there is, there is a thing in the culture of Alcoholics Anonymous that I think Josh would really love. And it's called the 13th step. Ooh. It's frowned upon, but it is sort of a rampant thing within AA that um, people end up hooking up with each other. The joke is that it's called 13th stepping. Yeah. So, you know, dry spell, Mm. you know, get get a little 13th step action in. and uh, That could at least encourage him to continue going to meetings. Yeah. Yeah, his sponsor, just the first day, should tell him about that. Just don't Brag be a sex pest. It. Behave yourself. <laughs> it need, need to be explained to Josh, I think. He would. Like, Eyes would light up oh, at yeah, the mention of that. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Oh, so, all right. And, yeah, we got all thirteen steps. It's been really, really good to talk about all this. I think that we've done a really good job of not just talking about his addiction and kind of retracing a lot of the same topics that have been discussed before. We've talked a lot about his recovery and how to address this, not just saying that he's a miserable addict and his life sucks. I always want to root for Josh, yes. honestly. Oh, like, yeah. I, I really do. You know, it's it's definitely become a little bit more difficult. But, like, still, I've been watching him for almost, like, 10 years now. I want to see him do good. I want to see him be okay, if, if for absolutely no other reason, for selfish reasons. Because when he's doing good, his content is great. I want to see him get help. I don't want to see him go down the roads that I had to go down. I want to have him keep making videos and have them be good videos that everybody gets a kick out of and For sure. not die. Not no, die. Not die. I should be on the chair with bugs in it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really hope that there's some end in sight for this, this whole period but i don't know what it's gonna be so good question i mean how is this yeah. gonna end yeah because it's it's getting pretty wet and wild right now we're we are right at the edge of uh some some different paths he can take of, of this big old tree he's got going uh and yes. that is i mean if he keeps getting money one way or another and i think there are dedicated enablers not really clint but uh just viewers okay. who really get a kick out of fueling his alcoholism i believe there is a real group of people that want to do that that's very dangerous well yeah and it's just like people sending him like liquor in the mail i'm amazed that you can ship booze like that yeah it's really weird to think about uh but there's plenty of people that could just do that in regular intervals it wouldn't break the bank for them uh, right. And just the sheer quantity, he could have a regular stream of alcohol coming in at all times. And if that's what they want to do, they, they can do it. He will get into stage four and really fuck himself up. Yeah, yeah. And I don't think he's in good physical shape to begin with. So those, no. those like physical changes will wreak havoc on him very quickly. Kind of getting back to the, the root of it is uh, one, control his finances, and then two, cut off the flow of uh, liquor coming to him. A lot of viewers haven't had the chance to see that when he has his full mental faculties, really funny stuff comes out of him because he's happy. And yeah. when he's happy, he'll create stuff, he'll make music, he'll get into really weird tangents, uh, he'll just be more constructive in general. and. That's where he really shines. He has a really weird brain. The way he thinks is so out of the ordinary. And when he's sharing stories and his takes on things, little things like, you know, farting at work, how he'll suck it up. Yeah. He'll, he'll sniff it and inhale it so that no one else has to suffer. That's really, really funny. And that's not something you're going to get when he's just uh, cooked. Uh, drinking so much alcohol and sitting there watching Terrence pop. It ain't going to happen. I want his human experience uh, outside of his little den. It's super funny. I would love to see Couch Chris make another stay at the new Cobra Lair. Oh, yeah. That would, that would be great. Oh, oh my God. Just take over his bedroom and be like, you know what? This is my <laughs> studio apartment now. This is the Chris zone. He's evolved into bed, Chris. Bed, Chris. <laughs> oh, if he, if his weight got so bad that he was just kind of a big guy on a bed playing games or something. <laughs> bed, Chris. <laughs>